Robert Putansu, mayor of the city of Port Orchard, do hereby proclaim April to be World Parkin Worldwide Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. So with that, I will gladly present you this proclamation. And would you like to say a few words? My name is Vivian Henderson, and I have Parkinson's. The reason I am here is because April is wide, worldwide Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, and I have come to make you aware of this debilitating disease and ask your mayor to make a proclamation. I always think we need a bell when we make a proclamation. I always look forward to the um, hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> we, did, we did that. Uh, debilitating disease and ask your mayor to make a proclamation that he and the citizens of Port Orchard will participate in voluntary activities to support Parkinson's education and the funding of research programs to find a cure. There's a couple of things I'd like to add. I won't take up much of your time here. Uh, Parkinson's knows no age, no gender, no color, no race. You just don't know when it's going to hit. I never heard of it till I got it. But thank you for your support and help, and thank you. Thank you for coming, Vivian. Okay, we are on to our next uh, presentation. We have. Uh, Mr. Wilson and Mr. Screws from South Kitsap Water uh, Reclamation uh, Facility, and uh, they're here to uh, give a brief uh, overview of the uh, uh, the operations at the uh, sewer treatment plant. So, Mr. Wilson, Mayor, City Council members, I'm Michael Wilson, General Manager, of West Hanley Util Utility District, and Randy Screws is the plant manager, and he'll be. Uh, joining me here in a minute. Uh, I know we're limited on time because we have a couple of public hearings. We did hand out a um, uh, print of our PowerPoint presentation, but we're going to skip the PowerPoint presentation tonight. Uh, we um, are going to just touch base briefly on the financial condition of the sewer treatment plant and then leave the rest of the uh, a lot of time for Randy to go over our, our, the achievements. Uh, what we have uh, for uh, kind of highlights of the sewer treatment plant's uh, end of the year budget status report is that um, we began the year with about a little over $2 million and ended the year with about $2.7 million, and that's the combined operating and capital budget. Uh, so we increased the fund balance by about $700,000. That's primarily attributed to the fact that we have capital projects being carried over into 2017. Uh, we spent about 98% of the operating budget, but a lot of the capital budget was uh, a carryover into next year. So uh, overall, the condition of the sewer treatment plant operation from a financial standpoint is doing quite well. Uh, we um, also have a, uh, kind of a highlight is the, uh, the original debt on the sewer treatment plant was $16.8 million uh, when the uh, district and the city jointly uh, borrowed money to expand and, and enhance the sewer treatment plant back in 2005 and six. And uh, we're now down to about $6.3 million, so that's slowly being paid off. The loans, the two public works trust fund loans, will be paid off in 2022 and 2024. Uh, we pay about $950,000 each year, so about almost 30% of the operating budget goes to pay for debt. So we'll be real thrilled when that debt is paid off, and then we can start using the money that we're contributing into the plant to pay for and set aside for future uh, expansion of the capacity of the plant so that the city and district will not be put in a position of going out and borrowing money and putting the burden on the ratepayers for expansion that will have that money set aside in the future. Uh, and then finally is that we just had a completed audit report that was done about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we had an exit conference and uh, no findings, no management letters, and the sewer treatment plan is looking very good. Some big changes. Uh, this past year, which uh, Alan can attest to as far as the Gatsby requirements, so that was a little bit of a challenge, but 
uh, we had to, probably the biggest thing is explain to the auditor's office the property transaction that occurred earlier last year where we uh, worked on executing five uh, quick claim deeds so that we straightened out the, the title and cleaned that up and they were pleased with that being taken care of. So with that, I'll turn it over to Randy and he'll go over the 2016 achievements. Mayor, Mr. Councilman, thank you for the time and uh, your report me. Um, so Mike will talk a little bit about the financials and we're in a kind of a brief overview. I'm gonna give you a little information on some of the achievements that were accomplished by the treatment facility and talk a little bit about our, about our capital projects that were uh, taken care of in 2016. Um, we continue with the community wastewater education program where we had students from the fifth grade of ETO. We brought them in to the facility as part of our educational program and community uh, interactive involvement so that we could uh, convey the importance of treatment and the environment and teach them about the, um, the treatment plan itself. Uh, in 2016, we also concluded our reclaim water distribution program. We ran that for a couple of years. And we did a financial assessment and determined that it cost us approximately 16.68 and about a little over 17 and a half dollars in uh, 14 and 15 to produce and distribute 100 cubic feet of water. It compared that to about four dollars and seven cents for 100 cubic feet of uh, potable water that's uh, produced and distributed. Biosolids 2016. A main accomplishment we had was we completed an engineering report addressing the current future management of the biosolids and the classification that comes from the facility. That was to help us determine what we could do in the future uh, and in the current time to determine what would be the most economical manner to dispose of our biosolids. Uh, we also did an energy conservation project last year that we didn't anticipate on, but uh, it came in front of us and it was too tempting to, to pass up. We were able to convert uh, most, if not all, the LED lights within the facility or excuse me, our current light bulbs to LED technology. Uh, and we got about a 54% grant funding or about $9,000 for grant funding for that. Uh, I if I'm not mistaken, it was, uh, I'm not sure if I have the numbers here, it was 1.6 years was the payoff on that. So another year basically we'll have that, um, recover that money that we invested. Um, MBR, we've talked a little bit about that. We're having some issues with it. It's reaching end of life and we're still in the process of working on it this year to uh, see what we can do with that in 2018. We did assign that as a capital project in the uh, 2016 uh, discussion for 2017-18 biennial budget. Uh, one of the things that was worked out, as you all know, uh, was the property issues with the treatment plant. Come to find out, um, we were essentially squatters because nothing had ever been re recorded and we got that all straightened out. And now the property is under joint ownership of the city and the district. Uh, we also did a secondary hydraulic mo modeling of the facility, and this was to determine the near-term rating assessment, the feasibility of only operating one potential system uh, at the plant, and also to come up with recommendations and findings to provide to the SAC to assess the financial growth and any impacts uh, to the city and the district as far as growth would be concerned. Um, we relocated our waste gas flare and did a lot of upgrades on that with the assistance of um, the state, uh, it was in a kind of an odd position, place where it was at. We're getting, the fire department was getting a lot of calls. People would drive up only on the hill. They'd see the flare come on, thought there was a fire. They were constantly getting phone calls. So we re relocated that for two reasons. One, it made accommodations for installation of storage buildings. And secondly, people when they drive by and see the flare, they can actually see there's a, a physical aperture there that the uh, fire's coming out of so they don't get excited about it. Um, storage building, we worked on a storage building in 2016. Staff did a lot of work on it simply because we were having issues getting contractors to supply bids on it. Uh, we did get it to one point and went out to bid again this year. Um, made some modifications on our HVAC system that was uh, old and antiquated, the 1984 installation to uh, reduce some of our energy usage in the facility also. Uh, we applied deck coatings on the upper decks in that facility. This has been an ongoing problem since day one. Uh, we spent three years testing different products to find the best deck coating that we could find to keep moisture from coming to the concrete. And it also had an expansion and elongation property that would meet the needs of the various types of surfaces that we have in the plant. We did finally end up with a, a kind of an aircraft um, parking lot type of 
coating that we put on and it's been working really well. Uh, the only downfall is that so now we realize that we also have water coming in sideways in the plant, which we didn't know before because it was raining uh, from the top. Uh, we also did a manhole repair in the facility. Uh, we had a manhole that was pretty eaten up and falling from the, the hydrogen sulfide gas that was forming and we were looking to replace it. We had initially got bids around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars to dig it up and replace it, redo the asphalt, and then we found a company that was actually able to come in, blast it, clean it, recoat it, and then put a polyurethane liner uh, that was impervious to any chemicals. Uh, you have a picture of it. That's about six, eight months <coughs> after it was installed. It looks just like it did the day they left, other than a little bit of uh, debris around the ring. Uh, we also did a, a boiler uh, modification in 2016. We took the 1984 boilers that were installed, we had them retube, new controls, and uh, some of the sensors installed uh, were also new. And then while they were torn apart in the boiler, the tubes pulled, we had a state boiler inspector there, along with uh, <coughs> our, our people that work on our boilers, and they did, were able to do a fine uh, detailed inspection inside. And it was determined that uh, the work that we did there and the condition of the boilers, they would last easily another 20 years, which is great since we have a debt service payment until 22 and 24. We had a couple projects to carry over. Uh, one of them was a storage building since that didn't complete, plank full of alluded to, and also exterior coatings due to a project that we're going to be doing in 2017. And that concludes my time. Is there any questions anyone has? I've got one on your boilers because we're having ours evaluated. How expensive it was it to retube them? It depends on the size of boiler. We did it as a package. Um, I could get you the exact cost for that portion. If you could send it to Mark and I, we'd be interested. Um, I didn't realize that was an option. Uh, so the, we're having ours evaluated. The one evaluated. thing that you want to do before you go through the process of spending the money of retubing is have them do the most preliminary inspection. Uh, that's where we're at right now. We're, we're having and we're having it um, to evaluated. Spend the money to pull that and find out that it's not worth it. Yeah, yeah. we're having them, the boilers evaluated right now. So, okay. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Randy or Mike thank you. for coming tonight? We greatly appreciate your the information. Okay, we are on to our first business item tonight, uh, which uh, is Mr. Martin. This is a second reading and adoption of an ordinance amending the 2017-2018 biannual budget. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mayor Patonso, members of the Port Orchard City Council and citizens of Port Orchard. Uh, we did uh, have this uh, read into the record uh, two weeks ago, so what I'd like to do is I'll, I'd like to write, read the first three paragraphs and then I'll turn to the ordinance itself and read the estimated revenues and uh, exp appropriations portion. The uh, whereas section of the ordinance, I think, uh, adequately spells out any particulars to those amounts. And then when I'm finished, if you had any particular uh, questions about the budget amendment, I'd be glad to answer those. Actions involving amendments to the budget take two readings. This is the second reading of an ordinance amending ordinance number 4016, adopting the 2017-2018 biennial budgets. The public may comment on the amendment following its presentation. <coughs> the city budget is written to capture revenue and expenses over the fiscal period. During the biennial period, changes to the budget in both revenue and expenditures need to be recognized by budget amendment. This budget amendment or ordinance recognizes changes to the biennial budget. Increases to fund balance reflect the review of 2016 ending fund balance, less amounts paid in January 2017 for expenses which occurred in 2016. To align the 2017-2018 biennial budgets to actual beginning fund balance. This process was contemplated as part of the biennial budget to confirm actual cash on hand at the beginning of the first biennial budget. And then I'll turn to the ordinance. Uh, it's page uh, 40 of 96 in your packet. The est estimated revenues, $609,650 to current expense fund number one, $212,500 to street fund number two, $100,000 to stabilization fund number three, 
$290,000 to the real estate excise tax fund number 109, 230,000 to the capital construction fund number 302, and $12,675, no, excuse me, yeah, that's correct, $12,675 to the cumulative reserve for municipal equipment, 250,000 to the street capital projects fund number 304, $400,000 the water utility fund number 401, $200,000 to storm drainage utility fund number 421, and $398,000 to the storm drainage capital facilities fund number 423. The estimated appropriations in the budget amendment uh, reflect $482,200 from the current expense fund number one, and I would mention that that money is moved into those funds that I just showed as an increased fund balance as revenue. This is that uh, identified $600,000 now being distributed to the various funds. Uh, $80,000 from street fund number two, $4,000 from community events fund number 107, $180,000 from the real estate excise tax fund number 109, 188,000 from capital construction fund number 302, and $80,000 from the street capital projects fund number 304. So that concludes the funds that, that are impacted by the uh, budget amendment. And as I say, a portion, uh, the, the major portion of this is the realignment of the fund balance, and then some appropriations that we had held over from the uh, biennial budget that we recognized and uh, did further work on uh, in the first quarter of 2017. So that concludes my remarks. I guess before we take, I know this isn't a public hearing, but uh, it does involve an expenditure of money. I thought maybe we'd take public comment if there was any, and then we can uh, have a motion. So is there anyone in the public that wants to comment on the proposed budget changes? Seeing none, then... Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Clausen. I move to adopt an ordinance amending the 2017-2018 biennial budgets for the City of Fort Orchard. Second. A motion and a second by Council Member Donlan. And uh, further discussion of the budget amendments? Questions, comments? On the second reading and adoption of an ordinance amending the 2017-2018 biennial budget. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We are on to item 7B, adoption of an ordinance amending the 2013 Shoreline Master Program, redevelopment of shoreline properties and minor clarifications and corrections. Mr. Bond. Yes, thank you. In October 2016, the City Council approved Ordinance 032-16, which adopted updates to the 2013 Shoreline Master Program to address redevelopment of shoreline properties and make certain clarifications and corrections. As required by WAC 173-26-120, the signed ordinance was sent to the Department of Ecology for a 30-day public comment period. And during that public comment period, the DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources, proposed additional clarifying language to the city's amendment to Chapter 7.10 of the Shoreline Master Program concerning moorage, docks, piers, and mooring buoys, confirming the DNR's role in reviewing and approving docks, piers, and floats on state-owned aquatic lands. The Department of Ecology requested that the city incorporate this language into the Shoreline Master Program amendment. Staff informed the Department of Ecology and DNR that the language was acceptable and would be incorporated into a revised Shoreline Master Program Amendment Ordinance. Upon approval of the re revised language, the City's 2016 amendments to the 2013 Shoreline Master Program will become effective. Okay. <coughs> so we have a motion or a I question? Would, I would be glad. I move to adopt an ordinance amending the Shoreline Master Program. Second. Second. By Councilmember Ashby, second by Councilmember Chang. Is there any questions or comments? No, what DNR requested I felt was a minor um, correction and very acceptable. Mr. Mr. I Mayor. Kudos are in order. Whenever you can get uh, through DOE with such a minor change, that's a, that's a well done project. Okay. okay. No other comments? We'll be uh, voting on adoption of an ordinance amending the 2013 Shoreline Master Program regarding development of shoreline properties and minor for clarifications and corrections. 
All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We are on to 7C, adoption of a resolution declaring the intent, intention of the City Council to adopt for the City of Port Orchard the classification for non-charter code city to, uh, to be governed by the provisions of Title 35A, Revised <coughs> Code of Washington. Clerk Reinerson. Actually, uh, I'm going to take over this You're going to take over this one, okay. So, uh, good, e good evening, Council Members, Mayor. Uh, over the past several months, uh, the City Council has been considering whether it would serve the best interests and general welfare of the City of Port Orchard to abandon its second-class city classification and adopt the non-charter code city classification and thereafter be governed by the provisions of the optional municipal code, Chapter 35A, RCW. The City Council, which has obtained public input on this issue, will be making a final determination on this question this evening. If the City Council determines that it will serve the best in interests and general welfare of the City to adopt the non-charter code city classification, Chapter 35A-02, RCW, outlines the methods for doing so. The Council has been considering two of these methods. The council, City Council may take action by one, passing a resolution declaring its intent to adopt the non-charter code city classification, or two, passing a resolution declaring its intent to place a proposal to adopt the non-charter code city classification before the voters in the next general municipal election. If the City Council determines that it will serve the best interest and general welfare of the city to adopt the non-charter code city classification, it is recommended that the City Council either pass a res resolution to declare its intent to do so, or pass a res resolution to declare City Council's intent to place a proposal to adopt the classification before the voters. Okay, Mr. Quas. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move to adopt a resolution to declare the City Council's <coughs> intent to adopt the non-charter code city classification pursuant to RCW 35A.02.030. I second that. Thank you. Motion by Mr. Clausen and Councilmember <coughs> Donlin second that motion. Do you have any discussion of this? I know this has been a lengthy process. Mm -hmm. Anyone wish to make any comments? Mr. Diener. I'd like to make an amendment to that motion. Okay. I'd like to also authorize the city's intent to include the um, provision for citer citizens' initiatives for referendums. Okay. So there's a, a uh, amended, uh, an amendment on the table. Is there a second to that amendment? I'll second it. I don't think I understood. For discussion. <laughs> yeah, for discussion. Um, okay. I, th I think this that. This evening? Yeah. Okay. So I've got a mo I've got a, an amendment on the, the table and a second to add the uh, initiative and referendum right. uh, provision uh, to Mr. Clausen's motion to uh, move this forward council manically. So it, it, did I explain that properly? Yes, you did. Okay, and Mr. Chang uh, seconded that motion. So as the motion maker, would you like to speak to your Well, I desire? just think that, it, you know, as messy as those can be, I think it is a, um, it's a good idea. It's, you know, it's, it can be um, something that turns around and, and bites people, but I, I think it's something that um, the citizens should enjoy. And it's allowed. Okay. Others, Mr. Clausen. Mr. Mayor, I'm going to vote against the motion to amend for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is that <clears throat> I don't think I personally have enough information on just exactly what's going to be involved in uh, approving the initiative. For example, uh, I'm assuming that forces us into a, uh, an election that uh, will cost the city. I don't know, but I'm assuming that it will. I just think we need to understand it better before we jump on it. And the second thing is that I think when we've talked about this process, um, at least in my mind, we pretty much agreed that we were going to just carry our existing codes into this new form of government without making changes and that we would take our time and look at whatever proposals we wanted to do at a later date. So for those two reasons, I'm going to vote against the amendment. <coughs> Council Member Ashby. I would just say um, I agree with Mr. Clausen in that I have started to do some due diligence in the initiative referendum um, element that is available once we are a code city, and it is a complex issue. 
and there are several decision points that I know I am not in a position to make this evening and that I would like uh, public input and a, a public hearing on that before we actually <coughs> included that. So, um, and I'm not prepared even to discuss it with any sort of accuracy this evening. Okay. Other Mr. Shang, did you, did you raise your hand or not? Well, I was thinking. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair, yeah, I would definitely second the sentiments of both um, Council Members Clausen and, and, and Ashby and, and just add that, you know, part of this, and I was so pleased over the last few weeks about the process that was taken to, to get this this far. I think we did a great job reaching out to our, our citizens and, and really seeking, um, asking their, their feedback, and we received a, a significant amount of feedback when compared to perhaps other issues that we've been talking about. And we have been consistent of saying, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do this one step at a time, and we wanna continue to have that public process with any type of change that we may make to codes as a result of moving to the Code City, and, and I feel confident that that's the right thing to do, and to try to package a number of things with this, I think is, is not the right way to go. We have not sought that, that type of, uh, of feedback from our citizens, and so I too would not support putting that in tonight, yet supporting going down that path very, very soon and starting a public process for things like the derelict building ordinances or some of the things we've heard about that or the uh, you know, initiative referendum um, and, and fully vet those through a public process before we determine that. And you're right, there's a lot of complicated issues with that, you know, fiscal impacts. And I think there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done to make sure we do this right. So um, I too will we'll wait for step two. Okay. I'm in agreement with the uh, previous council members, uh, Klaus and Ashby and, and Sean that we agreed to go into this cleanly and have as little change as possible, just just change our code over and then address each, each of these issues separately. And I think that's the cleanest way to go. That's the way we promised to go to the citizens and, and so I'll vote <coughs> against that. Mr. Chang? I have a question for the city attorney and I hope it's not technical. Um, basically, what would the process be for citizens to implement initiative and in referendum, assuming that we had gone to the non-charter code city. Is it any different than if we hadn't gone to the non-charter code city? Yes, the, the uh, initiative and referendum are, are not available to second class cities. So we would have to become a code city first before that would even be a possibility to adopt and, and to have, have the citizens ha have that option. And so correct me if I'm wrong, if my memory serves me right from reading the pamphlet, um, that particular provision can be done by the council or it could be initiated by a petition um, once we are a code code city. We'd have so to be. A it's similar to the way this could be implemented. This could as be well. implemented okay. too okay. from from a you know petition or, can, or, ballot or, measure. or a ballot measure. Okay. And there's a petition method to the as well as a councilmanic aspect to the initiative and referendum. If my memory serves me correctly. Others, Councilmember Lucarelli. I believe the hook. As we've moved along, we were all we were e with each step saying that we would try to have the code city um, codes be as close to the existing codes as possible, and that we would be addressing these initiatives later on. And um, I don't think this is a good time to change that. So I would also be voting against the amendment um, and looking into it further. Putting something on a ballot can cost tens of thousands of dollars, and we don't have a source for that, at, of income for that at the moment, and that was part of the discussion. So I look forward to that process. And for now, I will vote against the amendment. Okay, everybody's had a chance to speak uh, on the amendment. So we'll be voting on the amendment, which is to bring forward the initiative and referendum provision. All in, I should probably uh, show by a vote of hands on this one, since I think it'll be uh, potentially a split. Through. All in favor of that measure. I have uh, one, two votes, and opposed, I have five votes. So the, uh, the amendment fails, okay. From there, we're back, further discussion of the main motion. <coughs> Is there any other discussion of the main motion? John was the, count, the motion, motion maker. maker. Would you, you, you wanna speak to the motion? <coughs> uh, not really, I, uh, well I guess I will since <laughs> you asked. I agree with Sean's comments about the, the process that we followed in 
deliberating this issue and, and looking into it and trying to get our community involved in this decision. And I got to say, I was quite impressed with um, the results of the survey that you conducted on the on the website. And granted, it's a small segment of the total population, but as I said the other night, I think it's just an indication of you know the direction that, that people are interested in. So. I compliment you, Mayor, on the process that we used. <coughs> Thank you. Others? Mr. Diener? So we had, uh, by virtue of the survey, 80% support. So and even with a large degree of variance for those responses, still means support. And we've also asked, uh, I think, at that meeting and have looked at results, are there any downsides to, to doing this? And we haven't really seen any downsides to doing this. And I think this just puts us in the league with other cities and, you know, recalling that the six cities that, that do use, uh, that are second class cities, um, all have populations of less than 1,700 people except for one. Um, so I think it's a, it's a move that's long overdue. Councilman Brashby. I would say that when Washington became a state and it had cities in it, the legislature um, set the cities up in different classifications by population. And you had to be over 10,000, I believe the number was, to be a first class city. Port Orchard fit in as what was a second class city. And all of the cities um, worked under the rules of the RCW at that point. And then in the mid 60s, the state legislature decided that they did not need to micromanage the cities anymore. Um, and they gave cities all of the cities in the state home rule, not just the um, first class cities. They, they made a provision so that all of the cities could exercise home rule. I got the impression from the reading I did was that the legislature didn't want to have to deal with all of the things the city wanted in the RCW so that they could do it. So they, this is the avenue that the state legislature provided the cities to have home rule. There are 281 cities in the state of Washington. 275 of those are code cities. My question when we started this was, um, why should we do it? And now my question is, why did we not do this two decades ago? Um, I heard an uh, analogy this morning. I was listening to the radio, and there was um, mention of getting on a bike and paddling just as, pedaling just as fast as you can, and then you realize you're on a stationary bike and you're not going anywhere. That's where we've been. Or you can get on the bike and pedal with some efficiency and actually move forward, and that's where we need to be. And so I was one of those who was a little hesitant when we started the process, but now I'm wondering why we haven't done it a long time ago. And so I believe we owe it to our citizens to make the decision to become a non-chartered uh, code city. Mr. Clausen, will you? Well, I, I was just gonna add to my comments and to Beck's comments, I, I totally agree with you. And um, I can't see any downside to do this. Everything that I see is positives. And the last positive that I would mention is I'm really going to be excited to not have to declare that Port Orchard is a second class city. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, continuing with the, okay, continuing with the transportation analogy, we are abandoning our driver's permit and we're going to get a real driver's license. Mr. Chang, do you have it? Has, I, it has to be an analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Fred, I don't have to like the analogy, yes. Um, I, I want to actually commend you, Rob, for the process of putting it through the council several times and giving us and the public opportunities to ask questions. Um, I also like the idea of the survey, and I would agree on the first part that I, I think this is something that is more good than bad for the city. Um, the 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 part that I've struggled with, though, is that I've felt that when you can get input from the citizenry, you probably want to. 
And I, I, looked, I took another look at the survey and I got a electronic version because it seems some of the comments were cut off. So I looked at them and I would agree that I didn't see any downsides, but there were a couple things that made me pause. One is that it is a survey and I would say the survey is not, and I'm sure we all agree, the survey is not intended to be a substitute for an election. We know that it is not the same. It's just sort of a barometer. It's somewhat imperfect. Um, one reservation I had is that somebody said that not everyone is, believe it or not, on the internet. So they may not be aware of this, this option to get their input in. So I thought, okay, that's, that's a valid concern. That still doesn't quite change the needle on uh, you know, th what the proposed um, outcome would be. And I think what made me comfortable though with, with voting for this as, as a um, councilmanic action is a couple things. One is that this item is not the same as Proposition 1, which is placed on the ballot two years ago. Um, as we've said before, that, that ballot measure had two different items, and I think it was the other item that we are not discussing now, the change in city government, which we're not changing, that was the explanation for the outcome that that proposal made. And the second thing that made me more comfortable with that is that because of our timeline, we're actually giving the public the opportunity to gather signatures if they feel strongly that this should be on the ballot. And if they do so in the time frame, it would be, and it would also be on the most cost-effective election, which would be November. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable actually moving forward as, as my colleagues have suggested. And I will not make any uh, other analogies, except <laughs> I really did appreciate Bex about uh, your, your dishwasher's still working, <coughs> but you may need one with more bells and whistles. Or just or efficiency, parts. yeah, yes. with yes. parts, yeah. one that you can get yeah. parts. You can get parts for it. Other, Cindy? So was a little hesitant at first, but through the process, I feel very comfortable. And I too, like you back, wonder why we didn't take care of this earlier. So I will be voting in favor of it. Okay, Mr. Dina. And I'll just say something that I said at the town hall meeting. Um, quite often when jurisdictions look to improve their, their codes or their ordinances, they look at what others have adopted or what they're doing. And our menu is rather limited. Um, so this will give us opportunity to look around and, and borrow and improve from others. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we voting uh, to adopt a, uh, a resolution to declare <coughs> the city council's intent to adopt a non-charter code city through councilmanic action pursuant to RCW 35A 20.030. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. We are on to 7D, approval of a resolution approving a property tax exemption between agreement between uh, OVAH LLC and the city pursuant to Parochia Municipal Code 2.38. Mr. Bond. Yes, thank you. In 2016, the city established Port Orchard Municipal Code section 3.48 providing for multifamily tax exemptions. The city has received its first application for a multifamily tax abatement for the Olympic View apartment homes to be constructed by OVAH LLC. This project is to result in the construction of 38 apartments of which at least 20% are to be identified as affordable to households with low or moderate annual in household incomes for a period of at least 12 years. The project is to be located at 3410 Orlando Street. Pursuant to POMC 3.48.070, there are several steps to follow for approving or denying a tax abatement application. The first step is the director's decision to determine eligibility of the application. In this case, the director has determined that the application is eligible as the project meets the criteria for the 12-year exemption and the project is located in the residential target areas as shown in Port Orchard Municipal Code Section 3.48030, subsection 4. Once the director has determined eligibility, the next step in the process is for the applicant to enter a contract with the city regarding the terms and conditions of implementing the project. The attached resolution has been uh, provided to approve the contract between OVAH LLC and the city for 12 year tax abatement and has been prepared in accordance with three point, uh, POMC 3.48. Once a contract is in place, the city is to issue a conditional certificate of acceptance of tax exemption 
and once the project has been constructed and provided that it meets the requirements of all codes and the attached contract, a final certificate of tax exemption will be issued and filed with the county. City staff recommends approval of the resolution as presented. Motion. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution approving a property <coughs> tax exemption agreement between OVAH LLC and the city pursuant to Municipal Code 2.38. Second. Okay, motion is second. Uh, on this, any, I could, Mr. Diener. Just a quick question for Director Bond. Um, if, if there are <coughs> two buildings being constructed, do both buildings have to get their certificates of occupancy before the tax exemption gets underway? That is a good question. Um, I think that the important thing would be that the 20% of the units that are available to affordable households right. would have to be in place. And so if all of those are in one building, um, presumably you could move forward with it, but it really depends on how they decide to allocate those units, which I think are spread across the lower floors of, of both buildings, so. Okay, so that would be the tripping point, is that 20%? Correct. Okay. Having talked to this applicant myself, uh, they, they had a, a project that, uh, was marginally profitable, it wasn't moving forward. Uh, you know, this is one of our challenged areas in the city uh, that uh, we targeted uh, uh, for, that we would like to see development and redevelopment in. So uh, they're very thankful for this this opportunity that this exemption provides them so that their, their project pencils. Um, we know that there's a housing crisis out there. We know that there's an affordable housing problem out there and uh, this, this helps put that some inventory out there for this. This isn't a big project, um, but it is, uh, you know, doing, doing a, it, it helping in that kind of venue. Mr. Dean. It's also pretty cool to see something happen so quickly after we put this in place. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clausen. Yeah, I think the other thing that I think is worth noting here is that as you mentioned, there's an issue of affordable housing, but I don't think it's good for the community to try to cram all the affordable housing into one area, i.e. the West Park housing. Mm -hmm. And by having this mixture of both affordable and market rate, I think we're going to work towards not having that you know, concentration, if you will, of, of affordable housing in one area. I think it's going to be much better for the city overall, and uh, I'm glad to see this This is working. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Chang? I don't know if anyone has the answer, but my question is, um, given the almost astronomical market rates for rentals right now, let's say with a one-bedroom averaging 1,000, do we have an idea what an affordable rate would be <coughs> like? I have that information in my office, but I did not bring it with me. It actually depends on the num number of bedrooms because you have to determine um, how many people are being housed and what the household income is. And so we were provided with the uh, Kitsap County median income data for the South Kitsap area, and that's what this is being tied to in terms of um, somebody making that wage, being able to afford a unit in this building. But um, it's it's still... Uh, I think I think there are a lot of affordable units in Port Orchard relative to that uh, wage, and so this is going to be in line with with a lower end apartment in our city. But I think it's going to be a much nicer product at that price. Other comments? Okay, hearing none, be voting for the on the adoption of a resolution approving uh, a property tax exemption between OVAH LLC and pursuant to Port Orchard Municipal Code 2.38. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. <coughs> we are on to 7E, uh, adoption of a resolution approving small works contract number C026-17 with Holt Services, Inc. for the well no, number eight pump replacement project and uh, documenting procurement. Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Your Honor, Council Members. In late 2016, the pump and motor for the city's well number eight ceased to function. During this interim period, the city's public works department utilized additional pumping from well nine and wholesale water purchases from the city of Bremerton to augment the loss of water source to the city's 390 zone. 
Therefore, on February 24, 2017, and pursuant to RCW 3904155, the city's public works department established a list of qualified contractors from the 2017 small works roster see resolution exhibit attached for the main category water facility construction repair and maintenance and subcategory pump installation inspection and maintenance then on march 3rd 2017 and pursuant to resolution 00915 section 4 limited public works process the city's public works department performed email requests for quote for the well number eight pump and motor replacement project from all MRSC small works roster contractors. By the March 14th, 2017 deadline, the city received three bids with the result as follows. Holt services, $30,972.98, tax included. Pump tech, $34,650.63, tax included. Schneider Water Services, $46,143.15, tax included. Therefore, on March 15, 2017, the city's public works department completed the MRC mandatory bidder responsibility checklist and confirmed that Holt Services Incorporated, being the lowest qualified bidder, understood that they needed to obtain a valid city business license. Therefore, staff recommends that the City Council adopt Resolution 012-17, thereby approving Small Works Contract 026-C02617 with Holt Services Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $30,972.98, tax included, for the well number 8 pump and motor replacement project. Councilmember Picciardi. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution number 012-17, thereby approving small works contract number C026-17 with Holt Services, Inc. in an amount not to exceed $30,972.98, tax included, for the well number eight pump and motor replacement project. Second. Motion and a second by Council Member Lucarelli. I guess the, the un, this is unfortunate, but fortunately it didn't happen in the middle of summer, so when we needed a lot more water. So... <laughs> Any other comments or questions about this matter? Okay, hearing none, we'll be voting on the approval of the adoption of a resolution approving a small works contract number C026-17 with Holt Services, Inc. for the well number eight pump replacement project and documenting procurement. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We are to our last item this evening, uh, item 7F. Approval of an amendment of, of Amendment A to w, DWSF loan agreement DM 13-952-185, contract number C043-14 with the Department of Commerce for the Well 10 project scope change to the Well 13 project scope. Mr. Dorsey. Uh, thank you. On April 10, 2014, the City of Port Orchard executed a Drinking Water State Revol Revolving Fund, or DWSRF, loan contract number C04314 with the Department of Commerce for the Well 10 Water Treatment Project. The general terms of the loan were as follows. The loan agreement was for $6,060,000 with the loan fee of $60,000. Loan forgiveness, 0%. Loan term, 24 Years interest rate 1.5 percent. Uh, payment month October 1st, and the earliest date for construction reimbursement was uh, July 1st, 2013, and the time of performance was 48 months to complete. In early 2016, the city's public works department determined that the original Well 10 project scope was no longer viable due to several documented and openly discussed issues, and that a revised scope was needed to successfully complete the project. The Department of Commerce and the Department of Health both concurred and have now approved Amendment A to DWSRF loan number DM 13-952-185 with no reimbursement requirement of currently expended funds and no change to the loan terms. Staff recommends the City Council authorize the Mayor to execute Amendment A to contract C04314 with the Department of Commerce DWSRF loan DM 13-952-185 for the completion of the Well 13 water treatment project. Okay. Councilmember Lucarelli. 
I move to authorize the mayor to execute Amendment A to contract number C043-14 with the State Department of Commerce, DWSRF loan number DM13-952-185 for the completion of the well number 13 water treatment project with no reimbursement requirement of currently expended funds and no change to the loan terms. Second. And a second. Questions or comments on this agenda item? Councilmember Lucarelli. This is going to be a wonderful thing to complete is to get started on well number 13 and uh, an excellent location for the new well. Even though we got started on well number 10 with the new technology and the information we now have, well 13 really makes the sense and is in the right place for our new growth. So I'm very much looking forward to this. Others comments? Hearing none, we're going to uh, be voting on uh, the amendment to the w w DWSF loan agreement uh, to change the scope from Well 10 to the now Well 13 project. All in favor, say aye. 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 Vote. Hearing none, the motion carries. <coughs> Misled you, we do have one more item, the approval of the March 14th uh, meeting minutes. I know we'll have two extension, uh, abstentions, Mr. Claussen and Mr. Kachardi. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to approve the minutes of March 14th, 2017. Second. And we have a second, multiple seconds over here. Um, discussion of the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, and we have two abstentions. Okay, we are on to uh, re reports of council committees. Uh, let's start with the uh, finance committee, Mr. Clausen. Mayor, I would just report that we have a meeting scheduled for March 30th um, at 7.30 here in City Hall. It's this Thursday. Uh, we are on to economic development and tourism. And our next meeting is April 10th at 9 a.m. here in Council Chambers. Okay. And utilities. Pretty much you saw the uh, most important aspects of our meeting tonight with the well and number eight repair and also with well number 10 and number 13 financing. We also had an update on the McCormick Woods Reservoir Surplus and how much land to include with the possible sale. Our next meeting will be April 17th at 9.30 a.m. Okay, and is there anything from the Sewer Advisory Committee? I know we had a presentation tonight. I think we've covered everything, thank you. Okay, land use. I've got a committee report. So on the 23rd of this month, we met at 7.30 for an hour. Present were myself, members Cucciardi, Clausen, and the mayor, and Director Bond. Uh, item one was a continued September 2016 conversation with Mobility LLC, who is proposing small antennae sites within Port Orchard. Uh, Mobility is seeking a franchise agreement for towers in our right-of-way. The towers would provide supplemental 5G data services with some capacity for voice service, but the proposed sites are limited to two so far, uh, and the towers are very obtrusive at 50 plus feet high and up to four feet in diameter at the base. So it appears that rather than siting various smaller antennae around the town with smaller overlapping coverage or zones, Mobility would like to site two large towers with very large coverage zones and some overlap. Um, so our meeting essentially focused on alternatives and they noted that the towers can be streamlined, for example, putting the cabinetry underground and that they could be perhaps located in other less traveled rights of ways, which may mean shorter towers, could mean taller towers. Um, and we asked them to come back with some alternatives, including what they have done in other jurisdictions. And we also noted that we needed to do some due diligence of our own on this very important matter. Um, item number two was an update on the Overlook Apartments that we talked about tonight, so I won't really go into that. Um, we noted that it was ideally suited for transit and ferry access and that it would have higher end apartments and great views. Um, item three, which was added to the agenda, was an update to the proposed McCormick Wood single family residential design standards to modify setbacks so that the habitable portion of dwellings could be within 10 feet of the property line or the right of way but that garages would be kept set back at 20 feet. And this is a proposal that will be added to a complete uh, residential design proposal package that we'll see in April. And members, did I miss anything? I think you covered it. No. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you for your report. Um, and, and our next meeting is on uh, April 19th here at 7.30 a.m. Okay, we've uh, got the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. Nothing to report. No report. And chimes and lights? Yes, we met and the discussion uh, focused on the downtown special lighting project. Uh, we are now working on the infrastructure to see if that project actually is feasible. Uh, we'll have more information forthcoming. Our next meeting is April 17th at 3.30. Okay. Uh, Mayor's report. Uh, got a few things on here. Um, last year we did the Fathoms Parade as a group. Uh, this year's parade is June 24th at 6 p.m. Is there a desire uh, to do that again? Um, <laughs> Mr. Dorsey snickering. <laughs> um, Passing out balloons, um, so I just I'll, I'll just I'll plant the seed, and maybe we'll talk about it a future work study session. Whether we want to pass out balloons or uh, throw water balloons or whatever it uh, yeah, entails, so that might be better. <laughs> More to come on that one. Um, I continue to put st uh, flyers out about the uh, Port Orchard. Uh, Day of Community Service, April 29th, 10 o'clock. So I think everybody's committed to being there and um, hope we get lots of volunteers uh, and uh, we'll continue to push that. Um, from our retreat, we talked about a survey about our city council meeting times. I believe an email went out to all of you today. Some of you have responded. So uh, if you haven't responded, please check your email and respond. And the survey question uh, that I'm proposing, we haven't put this out yet, but uh, would say, would you be more inclined to at attend a Port Orchard City Council meeting, if, including work study, if the meeting started 30 minutes earlier at 6.30 p.m.? Yes or no? So an acceptable question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll move forward with that tomorrow. Uh, we pushed a, a uh, press release out today about the bricks, and that's on the website, uh, the bricks and the tiles, to fund our uh, holiday decorations, our, our festival decorations. Uh, we had the homeless committee this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, we've uh, suspended the, the shower, mobile shower unit. Um, it's not being used. Um, that the, uh, the last, so the Lutheran Church on Mitchell, uh, last Saturday of the month, they provided 54 meals, uh, which is probably their, their highest. Um, in eight weeks, we had six users of the shower, and we had roughly 50 people there, and homeless people, and none of them the last two times felt they needed a shower. So it's not being used. Um, I'm told that as the weather gets warmer, um, that that will become more desirable, so we may reinstitute that. Um, the Kitsap Rescue Mission is the one bringing the unit over from Bremerton <coughs> and uh, manning it, um, putting the you know, supplies and everything. It's just not a good use of their time if no one will use it. So uh, we're going to suspend that for the time being. Um, we've raised so far $4,500 for the hotel vouchers for folks in crisis. Um, so we're close to implementing that. We needed uh, a little nest egg of money in that account with Helpline. Helpline's going to manage that for us and uh, track, you know, the how we're doing with that, who we're serving, and that we're getting them to to uh, resources. That, that, that you know, this isn't a, a lifestyle choice to live in hotels. So, uh, and the severe weather shelter has been highly successful. We've had 18 nights that we've had it open this winter. Um, We've had guests on 14 of those nights and served 45 people total uh, in those uh, 14, 14 evenings that we've had folks there. So uh, the um, local pastors have raised so far $4,500 to buy um, more industrial type cots and mattresses. Um, bed bugs are a problem um, if you don't have industrial type stuff. And once you have bed bugs, they're tough to get rid of. So. Uh, uh, that's what they're going to use the money that they've raised. So that's what I have on homelessness and microphones. We're, uh, these microphones are working very well. We have those new handhelds like that coming, um, and we still have to install them. 
Most of the committees are using the mini tape recorder uh, and I've instructed staff that we're gonna use that uh, until we get the microphone. Those bullet microphones just aren't working and the sound quality is really poor. So until we get that resolved with the new microphones, we're gonna use the mini tape recorder and that's the only thing we're gonna put on the website because it's just providing much better sound quality than the little bullet mics. So uh, just gonna, don't be surprised that there was video before, but with video and moving mouths, it really wasn't uh, that useful. So um, that's all I have. And we are to uh, department heads. Mr. Dorsey. Yes, I have a couple of quick things. Um, so this Friday, as a reminder, uh, Mike Pleasance, our new assistant city engineer, will be starting. So um, that will be a welcome arrival. And updates to Tremont, uh, I guess uh, today is a bit of a milestone in that I received an email from Department of Transportation saying that they were finally getting ready to forward our package to headquarters. So environmental approval, right-of-way certification, plans and specs all have been checked off, and so it's going to headquarters. Um, what do you think? A month? I'm, we're calling in some favors. I'm thinking, I'm still thinking two weeks, oh, potentially. Okay. So two to three weeks. If we could go out to add by April 7th, then we could have a nice clean through re week window and get the bids opened at the end of the month or the first of May. So anyway, just, it's been, <laughs> it's been two steps back, one step forward just to get to headquarters. So um, I feel pretty good. Our right away certification three was approved. Um, along with that, so we had 14 temporary construction easements that needed to be updated from 2013. And then there were along, well, there were, I guess, a 12 and then two were actual driveway reconstruction. Those, it appears that all of those will be signed and ready for the 11th. I hope all 14, I, I know that I've got at least 12 that will be on the April 11th for on the consent agenda. Uh, rough numbers right now, we're right just at 29,000, but we had 36,000 in our right-of-way fund remaining. So there's fuel in the tank to get this last piece done. Uh, the other bit of, I guess, somewhat good news is we have the negotiated construction and management contract with Berger ABAM. Um, that negotiation was able to take our contingency from a 5% to an 8% by, we shortened the construction days for four, from 435 to 390 and made some additional adjustments on some personnel. And so that savings, that overall savings just you know, added 3% to our contingency line, so that makes me feel a little bit better going into uh, an unknown bidding climate with additional 3%. So at this point, the engineer's estimate and the overall project estimate looks very good. We just need to get to add and get good bids, and at that point, we have we have a team of experts to manage the construction. So we're... Get that moving, and then I can start thinking about Bay Street again. Yeah. So I know there's been a lot of heavy lifting with for you, and the uh, particularly when you've been short staffed. So good job, Mr. Bond. Yeah. Just two quick announcements. Uh, next Tuesday night, the Planning Commission will be um, having a public hearing on the Unified Development Code, and that uh, is in the middle of a 60-day written comment period. So you can either come and testify at the Planning Commission or submit written comment period, uh, written comments through the end of, uh, or I think the middle of April. Um, additionally, as of Friday, the, the draft sign code that was developed by our uh, sign advisory committee will be online as well. And so we're, we're doing a 60 day comment period on that and um, we'll schedule a public hearing at a later date once we've uh, cleared the, the uh, docket at the Planning Commission with the, what, the work that they're doing right now. Sharon? Hi, I have nothing this evening. Thank you. Okay. Brandy? Wow. It's quick. It's yeah. a first. How we do here. We got a wow. few, few people in the audience tonight. So, 
Ma'am, you, you were you've been patient. You were here earlier, so if you could step on up to the microphone, we're to our next citizen comment period, and uh, state your name for the record. And uh, you've got three minutes. Um, my name is, <clears throat> excuse me, Laura Peterson. Better? Yep. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. My name is Laura Peterson, um, and I recently just got my renewal notice for my car tax for next month, and I was <clears throat> surprisingly shocked at the difference from a year ago to this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I called the number talked to the Department of Licensing and they explained what part of the problem, part of the charges were and they referred me to uh, the one that the biggest charge was this uh, TB, TBD, T Transportation Improvement yeah, District, that, that yes. One. Okay. Um, and so um, they suggest that I you know, talk to the city council because my question and concern is that there are some of us who are either, well, we're one or the other or both, either elderly or um, disabled or have issues that our budgets, our incomes are extremely low. And this is really putting a hardship and like with property tax, I know that there are exemptions that if you meet the right requirements that it can, your property tax can be lowered. So I was wondering if the same consideration could be going towards this. And the other thing that I was wondering is before this was implemented, um, I mean, we were taking care of our roads. We have, you know, the highest gas tax we, you know, they've increased the, uh, the weight on the car. They, added, they increased that by $15. I mean, it, it's just going up and up and up. And a lot of us on fixed incomes can't deal, you know, can't afford this. And so when I had made my budget for this year, I based it off of last year's car taps. I figured one year's not gonna be that much difference, but $35 is a big difference on my income. And there may be some people that may be forced to not be able to drive, therefore they would lose more independence. Um, and in my case, the nearest bus stop, I can't even physically walk to it. So for me to give up my car in form, you know, because I can't afford this gigantic in my, in my opinion, on based on my income, this is a gigantic um, difference. That doesn't solve the problem. It, it makes it worse. And so that's why I'm here. Is, and I did, um, I did call Jan Angel, who's over our district, and I have expressed the same concern to her also. And they are gonna be looking into it. Okay. So thank you for your comments and uh, Sharon, do you know off the top of your head if there's a low income exemption available? I was told to there wasn't. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that there is. I was just looking it up to see if I could find that out and I'm not seeing it right, right away. So, um, so if, if we're able to research it before the end of the evening here tonight, we will. And if not, give your name and number to the clerk and, and I'll get back to you as to whether or not that, that is available. I'm 90% sure that there isn't. In, in this particular, um, on this particular issue, but uh, we'll look into it for you. Okay, thank you for your comment. I was wishing you comment. Yes, ma'am. Mary Feltz, ten fifty Hull Avenue. When I've been here when they've talked about this resolution approving a tax exemption for this building. Mm -hmm. Where is that going to be built? Sure. Um, it is up above. The, the district runs downtown and up 
in the Retzel area and up behind Kmart, this particular, the old Kmart building in the movie theaters. Uh -huh. it's, up, it's up behind there. The exemption truly isn't an, ex it is an exemption and it's an, an exemption to the increase in value. So what the property owners will do is continue to pay taxes on the current, their current taxes, they build the improvement, but for a period of time, they don't pay taxes on the improvement. Does that explain it? Yes, and how many of those uh, apartments are gonna be for low-income people? This particular project, Mr. Bond, do you know off the top of your head? It's 20%, 20% of it, and it's 32 yes. units, so. 33 units, so. Seven. And uh, so the others will be for people? Market rent, yes. Okay. Se and seven of them will be for low or um, moderate income mm -hmm. as defined in state law. So it's, it's low or moderate income. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very good. I, I'm glad to see that because there's a big need in this Certainly city is. for low income people. Okay, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Others wishing to comment this evening? Mr. Taggart, go ahead. I know you, but please identify yourself for the record. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Council. Uh, Dave Taggart, owner of the Swim Dead Gastro Pub. Kind of coming for you, the feasibility, asking you to look at the feasibility of putting in a couple of caution lights to the east and west of us down there on Bay Street. You know, we've taken an eyesore down there, and I think we're doing a pretty good job on turning that around, making it productive, increasing the tax base on it. We still have a long ways to go, but that traffic, is, as we all know, is incredible on that. Uh, safety margins are it. The, um, the, in, as we talk about the Tremont project coming, the traffic is just going to increase probably double, triple down there. Um, what we'd like to see is either just caution lights, one side or the other, or the radar enforcement. Um, signs of the cautions like going up Mile Hill mm -hmm. on that. I talked to Claudia Cross of the state a few weeks ago and she explained to me that it was something the city had to, had to consider and, and mm -hmm. put in mm -hmm. on that. So that's basically real quick, real simple on that. We're trying to do, you know, we've, we've added extra lights in there. We're trying to make sure everybody aware of it. As you, most of you are aware of, we are not a bar or saloon on that. So increased enforcement doesn't worry us on that, but the, with, the, with the force being stretched to its limits anyhow, something like this may be able to slow people down a little bit. As you come from Gorse this direction, you come around that corner, you don't realize that anything's there at that point anymore mm -hmm. on that. And we watch that traffic flowing, people passing each other doing 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. I mean, granted, that's probably an exaggeration, but it's just a point of time someone's gonna get hit out there I've never seen an accident on the stretch of road, although as I talked to some of my older clients from the clam bake days, they do attest that they have been issues out there before. On that. Something I'd just like you guys to consider, look at the feasibilities of it. You know, I know you got a lot of other places to put your money at, but uh, even if at the uh, least, if we could get the, if we still have the old radar trailer out there. We don't, we don't have a trailer, but we do have a mobile sign in our budget that uh, hasn't been acquired yet, and uh, I think we can look at whether... Someone like you guys to consider over the course of time. We're, feasibility we're, of having a base there. Between ourselves and, and the and the mentor company, we're putting uh, a lot of time and money in that for the long haul, so it's not we're not abandoning the project anywhere in the near future as long as I'm alive on that. Jennifer Mentor's committed a tremendous amount of funds into it, so we want to keep that thing going, especially, you know, we have one occupied building where there hasn't been 10 years now. Okay, thank you right. for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> Others wishing to comment? Uh, I just wanted to add that. Oh, right come on up to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> just state your name for the record. I know you, Stacy, but. <laughs> Stacy Bronson, Swim Deck. Um, right at that, where the pub is located, there is, it's a decrease at 35 miles an hour, and nobody obeys that, so yeah. just. Yep. You know, and, and it's just a cautionary thing. Yep, uh, we Thank hear you, me. and we've got another sign uh, in the works. Uh, probably we'll have it within three to six months at the latest. I know we won't have it tomorrow, but we'll, we'll consider that location. So, Others wishing to comment? Uh, Elizabeth Cottrell, 709 Kitsap Street. I'm not really sure where you are on your agenda. Uh, I know there's been some discussion about this code city versus the non-charter city. 
I hope you put it to a vote of the people. Um, regardless of the pros or cons, I think uh, I would encourage you to do so. Um, there's been too many things that have changed the city or increased the size of the city that I feel the citizens really didn't get to vote on. I, I hold McCormick Woods up as the classic example. They may have voted to join us, but we sure didn't vote whether we wanted them to. That would have been a really good thing to vote the whole town about, you know. So I would encourage that. Uh, there are many things, many, many things I could ask about, complain about, but I'll try to limit it. Um, could somebody tell me why all my parking tabs are getting an extra $20 tacked on and what on earth am I getting for it? I'll start with that one. Okay. This is citizen comment period, not a question and answer yeah. period, but it is a, it's the transportation benefit district. What and benefit is it? It, uh, for straight street preservation and paving. Thank you for your comment. Uh, others wishing to comment? Mr. Whittleton? Nick Whittleton. Um, first off, the, the uh, retreat uh, not being recorded, that does nothing for transparent government. Um, most people work during the day. Some of us have optional that, uh, but just having it open to the public is not a, necessarily a transparent government. Um, all through this process of non-charter code city, we have been told we're going to roll over the city's current code. And I knew all along that we were going to switch over to 35A, but everybody held fast that we were just going to roll over the city code. Okay, that just... And tonight, the way it was said that the council will not utilize any of 35A, and I don't get that. And then every time the city put anything out about Code City, initiative and referendum was dangled like a carrot. When we had our open house or whatever you call it, it was discussed, it was the most discussed item. And here we are, nobody knows anything about the item. It, it, it should trouble everybody. I, that's, that's all I got. Thank you for your comments. Bobby, you're the only one left. No, no comments tonight? Sharon, do you have an answer for me on whether or not there is a low income exemption? I, I do have an answer. Unfortunately, the answer is no. So, there is there is not, unfortunately. <clears throat> I, it is, I don't believe it's allowed under state law. That's what the, that the attorney was looking in the RCW, which is state law. So, with that, our meeting is adjourned.